Scott Pilgrim, The Solipsism, by Pinot. Chapter 1. The Rocket. Scott, can you come here for a second? Being the excellent older brother he is, and needing little to no prompt to get out before Kim started manhandling Stephen Stiles and leaving it on him to intervene, Scott obediently meets his sister at the backstage door. What's up? Well, I kinda need to use the little girl's room, so... Scott gives her a look. It's not like Stacy needed him to walk to the bathroom since she was in preschool, so he leans on the next most plausible answer. Uh, you need me to go buy you girl stuff? True, Stephen Styles may kill him if he rushes to the store now, but one can't grow up raised by teenage girls like Scott and not know that when one sends you on a quest for a very specific hygiene item, it's because they wanted them yesterday. I can ask Kim if she's got any tampons. Do you want chocolate? I think I have some in my pocket. They kind of melted, but... Did... Do you need my parka? No, darling, that's very sweet of you. Stacy smiles patting his arm with clear feminine approval. What I need for you to do is chaperone my date. Uh, why? How long do you plan to take? Scott, it's a public bathroom in a seedy venue. Half the female population of Toronto is in the line. A glance confirms this to be a fairly accurate statement. Scott has no idea why there's a permanent two-block line leaning to the girls' bathrooms, but it seems to be one of those reliable, universal constants. What do girls even do there? Coven meetings? Ritual sacrifice? He wouldn't put it past them. And what am I supposed to do? Wordlessly, his sister points to their table, where Wallace is looking well pleased while he chats up Stacy's bespeckled date whose name is already beyond Scott's ability to recall. The gauge measuring the poor guy's heterosexuality is sadly depleting at a rate of about 3.7% per minute. What, you want me to control Wallace? He splutters. You know he's a force of nature, Stace. I can't stop him, he must roam free. Like, like, Canadian beefers, or mooses, mooses? Meese? Scott. What even is the plural of moose? Scott! Focus! The tone alone makes Scott's fight-or-flight instinct rear up. And he knows better than to fight his sister, so it's mostly just panic. Well warranted, considering she has him cornered. Look, you brought a guy with glasses to an event Wallace attended, okay? He shrinks against the wall further. I don't know how to tell you this, but he was lost the moment he arrived, and now he's part of the circle of life, or the food chain, or whatever. He's gone. He's gone. And you'll just have to Hakuna Matata your way out of- Scott, I am not losing another guy to Wallace. Menace poisons her statement. Now, this can be because you cashed in your best friend credits to buy your favorite sis a few minutes of respite, or- because the boyfriend-stealing menace housing you happens to go missing under mysterious and violent circumstances. The choice is yours. You're my only sister, he mutters, desperately searching for an escape route. And you're not my only brother, Stacy reminds him, looming threateningly despite the fact that he has a full head on her. Her saccharine smile says they both know she can smell his fear. So, what's it going to be? Clearly, he's the best brother slash friend slash roommate in all of the history of Toronto, because by the time Stacy's date bar is below 60% and Wallace is leaning in for what's undoubtedly going to be a lot of sloppy kissing, Scott's hand blocks the area between them with a well-placed karate chop. What the... Nope. Stop. Scott straightens Wallace's chair, both to create some much-needed room between Jim? Johnny? James, maybe? And because Scott's pretty sure Wallace will fall on his face if he leans any further. W 
Scott! Wallace glares at him, but Scott's far more intimidated by his sister than his roommate. So he just grabs Wallace's beer, rubs the excess condensation off, and flicks it at him like one would at a stray. Hands off. Not for you. Stop that. Wallace hisses, edging away. You stop. You're the one throwing gross beer water at me. And I wouldn't have to, if you could keep your mitts off my sister's- Scott! An all too familiar voice calls. Scott freezes, immediately shifting modes from self-righteous to panicked. Two girls sidle up to them. They're very young, very Asian. He quickly turns around. If Pokemon Green taught him something, besides not going into tall grass and that you can't bike indoors, is that if he doesn't make eye contact, he won't have to engage. It is very unfortunate that Knives seems to be entirely unaware of this time-honored piece of poker battle etiquette, because she immediately glues herself to his arm, pressing what little chest she has against him with no small amount of deliberation. For the first time in his life, Scott Pilgrim not only wholeheartedly believes, but understands the level of desperation that may drive a coyote to gnaw its own arm off. A whole limb may be an acceptable loss even if it is his button-smashing hand. Particularly since there's not enough soap in their apartment to wash the solid coat of revulsion, he feels. If he could just slough it along his skin and make a dash for it, he would do so without hesitation. I thought you were backstage! Knives chirps, oblivious to his discomfort. Y yeah I had to check on things. Right, ban things, she winks cuddling closer. Scott's nausea and horror bar not only synchronize, but overlap, like an Evangelion. I told you, they're so real, Tamara. Just wait until you hear them. You'll just get it. The look Tamara levels on Scott tells him she's already got all that needed getting. It makes him feel greasy enough to consider penguin sliding over the dimly lit floor leaving a snail trail of mortification in his wake. Even Johnny or James's brows are raised in a way that implies Scott should reevaluate his life and choices. Which is honestly some hypocritical BS. Tamara, aka Little Miss, ping-ponging on dating the nerdy heartthrob for yearbook cred, and Mr. One Wallace away from smooching heterosexuality goodbye, have very little ground to stand on in Scott's educated opinion. Unfortunately, he can't voice it, and not only because he sucks at producing functional and conversationally appropriate witticisms. Mostly, it's because the words seem to be stuck in his throat. Maybe outcued by growing nausea. He's so busy concentrating on not losing his lunch that he fails to see the warning signs before it's too late. In the lull of his lowered defences, Knives weaves her arm around his waist and strokes a thumb under his shirt. Scott makes some horrified, inarticulate noise. His spine bends in a way he's not entirely sure spines are supposed to, backwards at the waist like a folding chair, or like he's a five-time undefeated limbo champion. It's awkward, to say the least. Knives gives him a confused, worried look. Her friend narrows her eyes at him, and Scott gives them what he hopes passes as a natural smile from his upside-down, exorcist director's cut style pose. Have you met my sister's date? He hears himself gurgle, voice eerily thin. Scott, you have a sister? She's here? Why didn't you mention her? Knives starts patting her goodwill-acquired, faux fur lined coat, until one of the pockets yields a makeup case only to frantically start key retouches on her face. Oh, I wasn't expecting you to introduce me to your family like this. That snaps him upright, both figuratively and auditorily. You can't meet my sister! He screeches, over the unsettlingly sonorous crack of his spine. Y you don't want to introduce us? She asks, press forward. Something that 
and a couple generations of self-awareness might evolve into very real guilt, starts gnawing at Scott's guard. He opens his mouth in a knee-jerk reaction to blurt whatever his brain comes up with to somehow make things better, but is saved from verbal suicide by a cold hand, faintly tasting of gross beer water. Actually, knives? Wallace interjects smoothly, and while Scott just knows his children will be indentured bitches to this beautiful, wonderful asshole for generations to come. What Scott means is that Stacy's not here right now, and he was actually taking me out for some air, since I'm a little tipsy. Scott has never in his life been more happy to be dethroned as the best friend roommate of all of Toronto. It's the lifeline he needs, and he clings to it like a cat who just fell in a full bathtub, claws out and scrambling for purchase he does have inflicted damage. Y yeah w what he said, Scott grins, upturning Wallace's chair like he's on a wheelbarrow, and picking him up before he can crash on the floor and waste precious milliseconds of a head start. I can't introduce you, because she's not here, and we've got to go out, where all the air is. But we are going out, bye! Wallace does that thing he does when he wants to be contrary to prove a point, which means he leans his body backwards and tries to dig his heels in. This has never worked before, and doesn't work now, on account of him being a wimp. Out! Let's go, let's go! Move it! Don't push it, Scott, Wallace warns. But Scott ignores him, and pushes both it and Wallace towards the security exit. Right now, the sweet, polluted air next to the back alley dumpster is as if a poster child of the promised land, flowing with peace, quiet, and a staggering lack of young, nubile Asians. Chapter 2. The Rocket. Or, at least, the alley behind it. Outside is much colder than anticipated, particularly without a jacket. Scott has no intention of returning to that death trap, however, so he just drags Wallace to the closest wall with a modicum of shelter and body blocks the worst of the wind. Considering his insides are reaching heat levels akin to Chernobyl's core reactor, he can take it better than Wallace. I can't believe this is happening. Scrambling for purchase, Scott's hot fingers find his burning face flesh and dig in. It does not make things more pleasant. I can't believe you cock blocked me like that. What happened to bros before hoes? You were the hoe! He pushes Wallace's shoulder a bit to emphasize his words. This wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you. Stop stealing Stacy's boyfriends. Excuse moi, Wallace snorts in awful accented French. First of all, some boyfriend if he'll go for the first guy he'll make eyes at him, Scott. We both know your sister deserves better. Second, those are some bold words from the guy who set a date with two different girls on the same night. Scott nods at the indisputable truth of the first part before grounding at the similarly indisputable follow-up. Nod switched to slumping against the wall with a dry thump. How did this happen? It's a rhetorical question, but of course Wallace has to add his two cents. I'm gonna go with, you forgot Knives was gonna be here when you invited Ramona, and then you pussied out of breaking up with your fake high school girlfriend, forgetting that the Amazon delivery girl was coming. Scott stops banging his head against the wall long enough to give him a disgusted look. What, did I get it right? Wallace asks. Eyebrows up. Pretty much, yeah. With a snort, his roommate bursts out laughing, which makes Scott desperately wish he had a glass containing significant amounts of booze and ice. Unfortunately, all he's running on is the one Pepsi he nabbed from Neil. Besides, he's more of a manic drunk, and he doesn't really need any help with that department at the moment. There's a whole ass committee inside of his head scrambling to make sense of this clusterfuck. He can almost hear them now, a cacophony of hurried footsteps, chaotic cries and blaring alarms. The tiny Scots manning his tiny brain, working overtime to figure out the not-so-tiny situation. Scott gets the feeling that 
If he keeps fucking up like this, they'll revolt and overthrow him as the one true Scott. Can you not? He pulls himself together enough to retort. It's not funny. Sorry, guy. Wallace chuckles. Inserting his hand between Scott and the wall to cushion his cranium from further self inflagation It's just... How do you keep ending up in these situations? I don't know. You weren't there, okay? He whines, smushing Wallace's hand against the wall firmly before relenting. I just... I didn't want her to cry. You mean you didn't want to see her cry? Is there a difference? Sure. The part where you lie to yourself about how it wasn't that bad and then use your sick mutant mind powers to convince yourself it's true. Scott opens his mouth to dispute it, but nothing comes out. He settles for giving Wallace a light kick, consoling himself in the knowledge that at least his X-Men Academy admission letter must be on the way. You suck. Scott finally pouts out. Well, yeah. And I've got outstanding reviews on my technique, too. Wallace hums, looking far more pleased than anyone with self-respect has any right to be. But that has nothing to do with the fact that you need to go back there and break up with your fake high school girlfriend. You know, like you promised me you would. What? No! No! I cannot do that now! Aghast, he digs his hand into his hair to grab fistfuls worth of at least two hippies. Everyone will see! Ramona's there! What if she doesn't want to date me after that? Your priorities astound. Wallace's fingers reach over Scott's and gently untangle from where he's pulling rather than tugging. Personally, I'd be a lot more concerned about having half a dozen ladies do irreparable damage to your dick. What? Scott gives his so-called friend a look, while letting him fidget his hair into some semblance of order. He has no idea what Wallace is even talking about. No? Why would I- Who would do the kicking? I don't even know that many girls. Well... Wallace's hand comes up, and his fingers start ticking them off item by item. Knives is going to kick you for cheating. She brought her friend, and if she's best in material, she'll kick you twice. One for being a dick to her friend, and another for cheating on her. Ramona's going to kick you for being a cheating cradle snatcher. Kim will kick you for being unable to play on account of all that blunt trauma having completely shattered your pelvis, and Stacy may hit you one last time for having dragged her into this whole circus. And also because I stole her guy. It's with mounting horror that Scott begins to understand the severity, the reality of the picture Wallace is painting. Too real, one could say. So real, in fact, it might as well be playing in 3D theatres for an exorbitant and frankly ridiculous fee. You don't even get to keep the glasses. It's not worth it. The good news is that this brings his mind bureau right back to business. The footsteps fall faster. The yelling intensifies. The alarms klaxon. He imagines this is what Wall Street might look like during a financial collapse. The bad news is that the numbers are in. And as statistician Scott grimly announces, there is a 97.6 certainty that Wallace's prediction is correct. His pelvis will be shattered. Reconstruction may very likely be necessary, and Scott MD wonders if that kind of technology is even accessible. Healthcare Scott's not sure their insurance covers Cheetah, so that might necessitate paying out of pocket, which accountant Scott travelly reminds them are completely empty until his parents decide to take pity and send birthday money. Which... Birthday Scott reminds the delegation is still months and months away. Survivalist Scott is considering selling a kidney. Surely they don't need both, right? Lots of people live incredibly fulfilling lives with just one. Scott MD is quick to remind him that a lot of people also have better diets. Living with Scott, who pays for the groceries and has the eating habits of a fussy toddler, means broccoli's the only green option. Which is just for him. And that's a hard pass. That gets accountant Scott going again, because if they'd saved the money they got from selling their Wallace's old games, instead of immediately spending it on slightly newer games, they could afford a better diet. Of course, if they didn't have the games, they'd have to be all alone with their thoughts, 
impulse management Scott points out, and no one wants that, do they? What follows is the dim murmur of practically unchallenged agreement as a clangor from Accountant Scott cattily defaming Impulse Management Scott for always ruining everything for them. In response, IM tells everyone Accountant Scott is just jealous that he got the most important job, which ironically causes everyone to lose all their self-restraint and soon it's a full-on survival game in there, Battle Royale style. Scott prays the fire and evacuation alarms are only symbolic and not a sign his psyche is in danger of structural and fiscal collapse. In the background, survivalist Scott is crying, Game over, man! Game over! With the kind of finality worth a night of murderous aliens. His face must say how aware he is of his unwittingly scheduled groin realignment, because Wallace snorts and puts an arm around his neck in a friendly gesture. Don't worry, my guy. Fake underage girlfriends and American girls absolutely dumping your ass might come and go, but being my bitch is forever. That is such an asshole thing to say. And yet, something about Wallace just teasing him in his usual, way too caustic manner is the soft reboot Scott's poor, overheated, out of warranty mainframe needs. The normalcy, the reassuring everydayness of it, is exactly what it takes to have Scott's overwhelming mounting stress pop like a soap bubble. Maybe it's a bit too much. The same way silence has its own stinging pitch after eardrums shattering levels of noise. And it's in that void of tension, or metaphorical mental delegations, that Scott puts up a hand to hold the arm Wallace has around his neck. Tugs on it a little and leans up. And that's all it takes. He doesn't even register what he did until he pulls away. Wallace looks confused, which is obviously better than him looking disgusted or annoyed, but Scott's unsure exactly by how much. He is aware, distantly, in a sort of sightsee-like touristy way, of the reverb of his pounding heart and how it has his insides shaking like the foundation of an out-of-code building. But that's something that's happening to parts of him disconnected from here and now, where he's still standing in front of Wallace. Close enough that Scott can feel his nearness as a body heat thing. Wallace smells really, really good. That's a weird thought. Should probably be at least a little weird or uncomfortable or... something. Like last night with Ramona and Ben. It isn't. Wallace always smells nice. Homosexual perk, maybe? What was that? Wallace asks. Scott shrugs. Mostly because... He knows Wallace knows what a kiss is, and also because that's not what he's asking. It's not like Scott even knows the answer either. And for once in his life, Wallace seems uninclined to expose it. He's just there, giving Scott a look that manages to be curious without making Scott feel crushed under the weight of expectation. It's just the two of them, standing in a dimly lit alleyway, seconds ticking with neither of them making a move to leave. Scott doesn't wonder what this all means, because he kind of already knows, and Wallace... Wallace looks calm. Inviting, maybe? Definitely kissable. So Scott leans back up, and this time Wallace meets him halfway. It's just a brush of lips, unexpectedly soft and gentle. Scott's seen firsthand the way Wallace Max on you guys when he's made up his mind to corrupt someone, and it always seemed a lot more messy and demanding. Then again, Wallace is usually trying to get them into bed, and Scott's kind of already been there for some years now. A thought so droll it makes him smile against the other's lips. Wallace pulls away slightly, eyes narrowed and smile soft. 
What's so funny? He asks. Like he knows it's just a joke Scott hasn't explained yet. Scott's still smiling when he shakes his head and presses up to him again. Explaining can wait till they're less preoccupied. Obviously that is allowed and it's kind of better now. Past the initial awkwardness of kissing someone for the first time and... And it's so... so good? He really loves making out and it's been forever. Oh well, technically last night, but last night wasn't like this and he doesn't want to think about that right now anyway. Why ruin the moment? For once, Scott reads himself, down to the specific word. He hasn't had to think about terms like languid in a long time, since university at least, but maybe for the first time in his life he understands why complicated and uselessly specific words like this exist. And it's such a relief to know he can still do this, be close to another person without feeling like he and his body are on opposite terms, neither particularly close to a conclusive win. Wallace sighs and curls an arm around his neck to pull him closer, sinking his other hand into Scott's hair. He tastes like the beer he's been drinking, which Scott isn't exactly a fan of, but he also tastes like himself, which is Scott melting happily into it, contentment pulling in his chest drop by drop like one of those hypnotic water toys with the coloured oil. Wallace's fingers are freezing. They always are. But that's also familiar and pleasant. And Scott leans into it, encouraging more contact, feeling his skin warm where they touch. He revels in it, relaxing in bits and pieces like clockwork, each second unlocking new, interlocking cogs, loosening parts he didn't even know were wound up. It leaves Scott feeling a little groggy, almost drunk in the comfort of it. The pending internal prompt to begin the mother of all panic attacks is ignored with a polite but firm wrong address, please return to sender. On some levels, he's still aware he really should be going back, because Lee's band will be out and theirs is in a few minutes. But that's just the spectre of Responsible Scott speaking. And Responsible Scott has always been a very small fraction of the Scott pie chart, even before going ghost. In fact, the Council of Scots must have adjourned, likely with plans to unionise and demand better working conditions, because the majority vote is, don't move, and anyway, he's pretty sure time is broken or something because it can't be flowing normally. This whole moment feels like a big parenthesis, or kind of like when he's in the shower for ages but it's really more like 20 minutes or something. He would have been perfectly happy to continue macking lazily for a while longer, Maybe until time got its act together. Not that he's in any kind of hurry, but his hands have gotten antsy just holding the weight against the wall and not doing anything. So they'd gone to Wallace's hips. What was that saying about idle hands again? There was a warning in that particular can, he's sure. Hips is where they'd started, at least. But since he's a restless, fidgety idiot, it had taken him maybe ten seconds before they'd mindlessly started roaming up and down. One hand sneaks around Wallace's waist, finding warm skin under his shirt, and ends up stroking his back. Wallace arches like a cat, and makes some sort of pleased hum, which of course is very nice and encouraging, but then the idea of it as a concept gets to Scott in ways that the noise alone didn't. A sort of likes it there with the clinical interest scientist Scott would be proud of. And then he does it again. Deliberately. Experimentally. That gets a noise out of Wallace, that bypasses Scott's eardrums to instead be felt in the pit of his stomach. No wonder Wallace has a nigh-perfect success rate of getting any guy with that in his repertoire. The thought makes Scott feel uncomfortable. Because he's so busy emotionally addressing all of this while nuzzling a path down the side of Wallace's throat, he doesn't register the dim crash until rubble falls around them. A pebble actually bouncing off his head, before falling at their feet. 
somehow having the building falling down right now seemed just thematically appropriate. At the same time, Traumatic Irony Scott couldn't help but scream, Seriously? He pulls away just far enough to frown and say, Did you hear? But Wallace shakes his head and pulls him back in and says, No. And even the way he emphasizes the word has got shivering out of anything but cold. Wallace is panting. They both are. And he looks wild and flushed and a little desperate in a weirdly sexy way. Scott is still trying to process all of this when Wallace kisses him again, and licks his tongue, which sounds both difficult and a little weird when you put it like that, yet is incredibly hot, and Scott's whole thought process goes something like a spinning wheel comprised solely of fuck slash yes slash I want, then with nothing else to add careens down a cliff at mock speed. He complies with Wallace pulling with a groan, more enthusiastically than initially intended because in his haste to pin down something solid, Wallace's back thumps the brick audibly. Ow. Sorry, Scott blurts, two steps away from panicking, but Wallace just chuckles and kisses his nose. Scott's stomach responds with a weird flop, but in a distinctly nice way. Some free willy sea world worthy kind of performance. Wallace pulls him back in to lock lips, and Scott follows, relieved and pleased. He lets himself nestle against Wallace in all sorts of deliberate and interesting configurations that make him sigh into the other's mouth. And then the wall next to them blows up. Mr. Pilgrim, it is I, Matthew Patel. Consider our fight- uh, uh. Chapter 3 The Rocket Still Behind It Scott's sure there's gotta be a reason a guy dressed like a pirate just burst through the goddamn wall, Kool-Aid man style, and is now gaping at him and his roommate. He's also really quite sure it has nothing to do with him. So what if he called him by his last name? Surely. Surely. It has to be someone else. Some other pilgrim around in Toronto. It can't be that uncommon a last name, right? As if to dash every bit of his scrounged hope, the guy pipes up with a confused S Scott W. Pilgrim? 65 Alberta Avenue? Why does the pirate man know where we live, Scott? Wallace asks, voice a familiar low monotone of reasonableness. I have no idea, answers Scott, who's decided that if it looks like a nightmare and feels like a nightmare, it probably is. It'd explain a lot, actually. The Pirate Man. Tan, intense in that undefined psychic foe sort of way, and displaying more evil eyeliner than he's seen on a guy since other Scott on his last birthday, straightens up from his fighting stance, looking just about as confused as Scott feels. My name is Matthew Patel, and, um, I'm the first evil ex-boyfriend? You know, from the League? The League, Scott repeats, hoping to trigger an expository cutscene and take the chance to run while everyone's stuck watching. Didn't you get my email and letter explaining the situation? L letter? Letter? I... skimmed them? I delivered that letter during a blizzard, the man huffs, gesticulating in a way that encompasses the situation and also perhaps the building. Scott nods, trying to remain supportive. That's very punk rock of you, I think. His eyes dart towards Wallace, pleading for a smidge of context like an orphan pleading for seconds in a Victorian book-to-movie adaptation. Is it punk rock of him? He stage whispers under his breath. Guy, I have no idea what the hell either of you are talking about. Wallace whispers back. 
So it's not just me. Scott slumps a little in relief. Good, good. I'm here representing the League of Evil Exes, the pirate guy clarifies. Scott scoffs. Finally, something he understands. The X-Men aren't evil. Unless you're talking about the Shadow X-Universe. You sure you don't mean the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants? Because that's a whole other team and I am not joining Magneto. He trails off. A faint trickle of embarrassment penetrating via the befuddled look he's getting. He's probably being a total nerd. God, he's such a total nerd. Wallace chuckles under his breath, a voice a little nervous. And then, for whatever reason, he tugs on the hair at Scott's nape, which really has no right to make his knees want to buckle. No, I'm a jock, he says in a totally manly, definitely not whine, trying to regain composure and failing spectacularly. Your mom's a jock, Wallace hisses back, amused and evil. No, she's not! Scott hisses back. Yeah, she is. I'm not even teasing. Your mom's the jockiest jock who ever- Ramona's evil exes! Pirate man stresses, with the dogged, repetitive determination of a 3am cold, toll-free, vegetable peeler TV ad. You know, Ramona Flowers? Uh. Grouping for context, Scott glances behind the guy to the inside of the rocket, which had acquired a hole in the roof in his absence, and a whole room worth of passed out people on the floor, some stirring. Nope, this can't have anything to do with him. Can't. Stacy stands a little to the side, and when he looks at her, her expression is a silent and sickeningly familiar... What did you do? And because this is a nightmare, Ramona's standing right next to her. And her head glows. Cannot. Scott accidentally makes eye contact with her. Her brows convey the obvious question. While Ramona's brows, perfectly sculpted and probably dyed to match her improbably cute hair, convey a return message delicately tethered between bitch her on her own and Eat shit and die. The stare down is thankfully broken by her turning back to the pirate guy, who's noticed her and is giving a nervous wave. Hi, Ramona. Hi, Matt. At the withering response, Matt turns back to Scott. Look, obviously, obviously, there's been some mix up on the. Intel. He's looking at them again, and Scott's suddenly acutely aware of where his hands still are. He drops them slowly, trying not to call more attention to them, but refuses to step away because, regardless of his horror, his body's still in a bit of a state. Figures. Half of the time, the thing didn't know what it wanted or liked, and the other half, Scott didn't know either, or disagreed with the consensus. I'm so, so sorry for interrupting. I'll just go back home, okay? Don't worry, I'll update Gideon on this whole... thing. The pirate man waves, avoiding all eye contact. His fighting stance mighty morphed into that of a meek, lost puppy. Is anybody going... Can anyone give me a lift to the airport? and he slinks back into the rocket through the wall hole like it's nothing, displacing the small crowd of additional onlookers that seem to have regained consciousness and have gathered, with featured highlights such as Kimberly Pines, looking both unimpressed and a little awed at the depth of his being the absolute worst skill. Stephen Stiles, who was either gaping or accidentally dislocated his jaw during architectural mishap. It's hard to tell. Young Neil, looking confused and trying to pry Stephen Stiles' hands from where it is stretching his shirt. His fake teenage girlfriend, 
looking somehow both confused, betrayed, and like she walked straight out of a Disney special intended for tweens. His fake teenage girlfriend's teenage friend Tamara, also looking like a double straight off a Disney show, while impressively and wordlessly managing to convey the attempts to both find and end Scott. Whatever his face, not Stacy's boyfriend. Looking like he's feeling less than proud about a number of recent life choices, but taking solace in that at least he hasn't made any of Scott's. So, screw him, obviously. His sister, vibrating with some sort of barely repressed emotion that's seriously starting to trigger Scott's prey instinct. Ramona. Looking at him. Just looking. Scott turns to Wallace for help, but Wallace is doing that thing with his face where he's mutely telegraphing that no, he has never seen Scott before in his life and definitely didn't know who he was and is not actually associated with him in any way, shape or form. Like Judas before him. Only Judas wore open toe sandals and made sure to get paid for his betrayal before getting a smooch. Scott hopes all that silver was worth it and that Wallace can use it to buy that spicy mayo Scott likes so much. But right now, overpriced condiments doesn't matter. He's on his own. Ramona, he starts, having no idea what's going to follow. Scott? Tries knives, voice small and tinny. Wallace! Screeches Stacy making everyone around her jump. Her red face and drawn eyebrows hold all the threat of an infuriated goose. You've crossed a line, Wallace! Wallace doesn't even try to say anything to excuse himself, just nopes off like a frightened Giselle, which speaks well for his continued survival, considering Stacy's status just dated to murderous. It's only thanks to almost two solid decades worth of younger sibling wrangling that Scott intercepts her before she can charge with only minimal scrapes. But his shins are going to be feeling it for weeks. In a vain attempt at damage control, Scott fails, partially in his literal Stacy rodeo and partially grasping for words. What are you even doing here? He asks through an armful of thrashing, feral younger sister. Don't you have anything better to do? We kind of need our basis to play, Kim deadpans, eyebrows raised. You know, for the gig we came for? Oh, yeah. And anyway, half the public's unconscious, so... Were you and Wells kissing? Stephen Stiles interrupts, entirely too loud and for some reason verging on panic attack. I saw it. Kim saw it. We all saw it, right? Neil? Uh, are we pretending we didn't see it? Wallace! Stacy howls with renewed vigor, her shoe connecting with Scott's shin. Again. Everything sucks. Everything. Chapter 4 the park. He finds his roommate sitting on a bench in the park on the way back home, having correctly guessed Wallace would wait for Scott to collect his belongings. Even if he had some money for the subway fare, which he probably did at some point, considering there's three bottles of vodka coolers around him, Wallace's keys were still in his pocket. Not to mention, home's the first place Stacy would look for him. I got your stuff, he says. Thanks. Wallace reaches for his jacket, zips it all the way up, then mummifies himself with a scarf, hugging himself to make up for lost warmth. It really is too cold to be without outerwear. Um, are you okay? Yeah, I'm great, dude. Awesome, even. This is my favorite thing to do, you know. See shitty bands, get drunk on shitty beer, run for my life, and rely on shitty booze to not freeze to death. Wallace flexes to sell the image. It's how I keep in shape. Scott gives him an uneasy look, but Wallace leaves it at that and the extended eye contact is not helping at all. In fact, 
It kind of makes Scott feel like there's bugs crawling right under his skin. But he knows they're just in his head. Figuratively. He quantizes his guilt into a simultaneous state of scarless sensation and willful non-existence. Schrodinger would be proud. Succeeding on that does not help with the awkwardness, though, so he settles for picking up discarded cans and throwing them into the recycling bin, in an effort to avoid this whole visual engagement thing going on. But he can't help but ask, Are you mad at me? I don't know. Wallace doesn't sound sarcastic, which is unusual. He just sounds confused. Looks confused when Scott risks a glance at him. Am I? You sound mad. He also sounds a little drunk, but that hardly requires clarification. I do sound mad. Why am I mad? Because we made out? Scott mumbles, kicking at a pebble by his foot. No, not that. Wallace frowns like he's still piecing things together. But that's all Scott really needed to hear. Finally relaxing, he sits back down and moves closer to Wallace, leaning in and trying to help him warm up. Wallace settles against him, familiar and solid. They're quiet long enough Scott actually starts to nod off when, out of nowhere, Wallace jerks his shoulder away. Oh, yeah, because you used me to cheat on two girls and now your sister's gonna crucify me. What? No! Stacy wouldn't crucify you, Scott protests, wiping his mouth free of drool. I mean, we're not really religious like that, and she'd have to find you first and really fast, and I explained to her what happened anyway, so she shouldn't be too mad. You explained it to her. Wallace interrupts dryly. His voice pitching tent between the range of desiccated mummy and you accidentally left a pancake in the microwave for fifteen minutes. Y yeah So you told her you kissed me. I told her we were drunk? Wallace levels a look at him. Eyebrows raised and Scott ducks his head in something that feels uncomfortably close to shame. I told her you were drunk? Of course you did. Scott hates how resigned he sounds. Like he expected nothing more because what was the point? And it wasn't cheating. It's not like... I mean, it wasn't. Did you break up with knives? Uh, Scott suddenly finds the tree over yonder particularly fascinating, zeroing in on it to avoid Wallace's gaze. Sorta? It's... it's a work in progress? And you're also sorta dating this Amazon delivery girl? No, I mean, I don't think so. Maybe? That tree sure is a botanical marvel. Steve Irvin was right. Nature is amazing. I haven't exactly asked her to date me yet. Yet. You really think this girl is going to give you another chance after you ask her out and the first thing she sees is you kissing a schoolgirl and then you sneaking out to smooch the gay guy? Scott winces. Just thinking about the artificially sweet flavor of Nyza's lip gloss is enough to make him feel a little sick. He doesn't think he's ever going to be able to enjoy bubblegum again. Ever. I thought you didn't even see that. No, Scott. Everyone who's relevant to the plot saw you kissing the girl who's like two whole years younger than your baby sister, who you held as a child. We all judged you for it pretty hard. Wallace is obviously enjoying himself, so it's a pity Scott screams interrupts before he can finish. Ah! Why would you say that? He cries, staggering sideways so quickly he tips and collapses into a pile of snow. 
fingers barring in about equal amounts of hat and hair. Oh my god, that's horrible! There we go. Wallace's voice sounds entirely too cheerful. Scott would admit to hating Wallace quite a bit at this particular moment, but was unfortunately otherwise occupied by what surely felt like the anthropomorphic manifestation of revulsion, licking his spinal cord all the way to his nape. Which is fairly high tier in terms of metaphorical modification. He almost missed the bugs. God. It's not that he didn't know Knives' age or anything, but somehow that knowledge had been an abstract concept. Putting it out like that, comparing it to his actual younger sister, suddenly floods his awareness of not only the actual size of the gap in their ages, but how much of a kid Knives actually is. She really is that young! She's still in school with the uniform and everything! What's wrong with me? Hmm, where do I start? Dude, I'm serious! It's not like he wasn't aware that what he was doing was somewhat... problematic? Questionable? Particularly not after Cam rubbed his face in it, but it hadn't seemed so bad before. It had just seemed so simple and oh, so safe. Pick knives up from her class, listen to some simple school gossip that he'd actually understood. Something he could follow and remember. Maybe hold her hand and share some pizza and walk her to the bus without asking her for anything more complicated than a hug out of him. And now a girl that hadn't even been a concept when Stacy was toddling around being a menace without needing him or Lawrence to hold her steady had actually tried to shove her tongue down his throat. Thrice! I think I'm going to puke, he announces. Voice deceivingly steady. There, there. Now that you've seen the error of your ways, you can finally close this shameful chapter of your life. After you break up with her, of course. Wallace pats his back consolingly. Who knows? Maybe in a couple of years, we will even forget to look at you suspiciously when a school bus passes by. Scott just buries his head deeper in the snow, and moans around a mouthful. It's only when he's running out of air that he looks back up. Wallace is still there, crouching next to him like he has nothing better to do than wait for Scott to be done making stupid choices. He's giving Scott a look that he can only classify as fond adjacent. It's the reassurance of it, more than the significant weight of his shame, that prompts the next words that come out of his mouth. I have to break up with her. Wallace hums agreement, fingers brushing loose snow from Scott's hair. And Ramona's not going to give me another chance. I sure wouldn't. Scott's actually pretty sure Wallace would, but he's at least smart enough to know better than to say it out loud. Unfortunately, he's not smart enough to filter the next thing that comes to his mind. Then, uh, what about... You know, us. Scott knows that was not the right thing to say, just by the way that Wallace stops playing with his hair and pulls his hand away. What about us? Wallace asks, deceivingly casual, and Scott's not sure what to do. He knows that tone, has seen Wallace employ it with guys who said the wrong thing, or tried to hit on him in some unspoken but arbitrarily established as unacceptable way. He's never been on the receiving end of it, however, and it's completely unfair that he has to be now, considering Wallace usually knows what Scott's meaning to say better than Scott does. Shouldn't Wallace be helping him figure it out instead of cruelly watching him fumble like he somehow deserves this? We kissed. You kissed me. Wallace corrects, with the unforgiving, red underlined precision of a pirated Microsoft Word. A voice unusually cold. You kissed me back! Was... Was I s not supposed to? Wallace asks. Sounding genuinely baffled, and it's such a weird question it stops them both in their tracks. It never even crossed Scott's mind that 
Rather than not wanting to, Wallace maybe shouldn't have returned the kiss. The idea makes Scott's stomach drop a little, like an elevator in a horror movie. He's suddenly intensely invested in not letting Wallace dwell on that kind of thought either, hands nervously rubbing at his face for lack of a better outlet. Fine, okay, so I kissed you. Is it really that important? Scott scoffs. Yes. Why? Wallace frowns at him for a moment. Why? Huh? Don't play dumb. Why did you kiss me? Scott has no idea how to explain what was going through his head at the time, considering he did not understand it then and he certainly does not understand it now. I didn't think you mind, he says in the end, which is yet another strike against him since he meant it as an apology, not a justification. Wallace gives him a look that manages to be unamused, unimpressed, and resigned, all at the same time. Then he turns around and starts walking away, and Scott scrambles to catch up after him. It sucks when Wallace gets like this, because he walks at a sort of threatening 83 degree angle, and he does so really fast, and his legs are like supermodel long, so it's easy for him, but not so much for Scott, who can barely keep up. Wallace? He calls. What? Are you mad? Wallace says nothing, and keeps up the speed, which means he totally is or that he wasn't listening. Under normal circumstances, Scott would just presume the latter, call it a night and pretend none of this had happened. Maybe even convince himself of it in a couple of days. He does have very vivid dreams, after all. A little too lifelike sometimes. And it does get confusing to tell them apart, but he knows this is real because, realistic or not, his dreams never make this much sense for too long. And the idea that Wallace may actually be mad with him is too disturbingly plausible to leave up to chance. Wallace, he tries again, tone more plaintive. Mm. Are you mad at me? The specification seems important. Like seriously mad. This does make Wallace stop so suddenly that Scott bumps into him with a muttered, Ow. He's still rubbing his nose when Wallace turns around. So the sudden lack of space between them takes him off guard. Scott isn't sure how he feels about it, so he tries to take a step backwards. Only for Wallace to match it. Maintaining the negative distance. He blinks, confused, takes another step back. Wallace does the same, and they do it three more times before Scott hits his back against a tree and he realizes Wallace has him cornered. His first thought is that this is a little weird, and the second is that it's kind of an inversion on what happened at the club, which leads him to the third thought, which isn't a thought at all. Just a bunch of garbled up fizzy effervescence in his head that has him feeling like he shoved at least two packets of Tang concentrate into it. Tang's awesome, and he's not against any of this at all. And when Wallace leans down, Scott closes his eyes and parts his lips and... Kinda. Yeah. You're sort of a selfish bitch sometimes, Scott. His eyes snap back open. For a second it doesn't click. And then Scott tells himself he must have heard him wrong, or that he's having one of his nightmares. Wouldn't be the first time, but Wallace is looking down at him with a curiously detached look. Like he's considering Scott the same way he would a stranger, and not even a particularly hot one. What? No, I mean... That's not... how... how am I selfish? Wallace's brows reach new heights, like he's asking the obvious. 
Feeling trapped, Scott pushes him and takes a few steps away. Out of nowhere, he's baking between the combined weight of his parka, and knowing Wallace saw how eager he'd been for it, how much he'd wanted it. Wallace allows the distance, but his eyes track Scott like he would a mouse at their apartment. Why did you ask the teenage girl out? Why didn't you break up with her? He doesn't look upset, but Scott's known Wallace for a long time, and can spidey sense Wallace's moods the same way he senses his own mounting anxiety. An unstable Jenga tower ready to topple at the slightest unadvised push. And if you think you're in love with this Ramona chick now, why did you kiss me? I don't know. I know, Wallace says, and doesn't smile. Because it's easy. Because you thought it'd be easy. Scott opens his mouth to protest, but Wallace doesn't let him. You thought a preschool girlfriend wouldn't ask too much out of you. And as soon as someone newer and shinier and cooler showed up, you started going after that without even dropping the schoolgirl. Just in case you needed a backup. I tried to break up with her, he tries to say. But Wallace cuts him off again. And then you screwed up. And it became obvious Ramona wasn't going to be in the mood for some romance. You went and dumped yourself on me. Because I'm the easiest, closest available option. It wasn't like that. And how was it? He doesn't know what to say. Which isn't something exactly new for him. But the fact that what Wallace just said sounds so... Well, obviously not accurate, but, like, plausible? It's not like he can't understand why someone looking from the outside would see it that way. Not that it was like that, because Scott knows he didn't think of it like that. Not like his brain. He can't have. He wouldn't. N not like that. You're making me sound like a user, aren't you? He glares at Wallace, expecting him to be ashamed or apologetic, or at the very least as desperate to take his words back as Scott is to unhear them. But Wallace just stares back, looking both unimpressed and whatever the complete opposite of regretful is, and Scott looks away first. I can't believe you just said that to me, he says, voice hoarse. He really can't. Not Wallace, of all people. He's... He's supposed to be Wallace's favourite person in the world. Is that how he sees Scott? Is that how all of his friends see this whole thing? Is that why they've been so angry and mean to him lately? And I can't believe that someone who got so traumatised at finding out his girlfriend was cheating on him would go around and do the same thing to some poor kid. Scott feels sick, and isn't sure if it's because he's now thinking about her, or what his roommate is saying. For someone who's so incredibly useless at fighting, Wallace Shaw knows how to deliver some devastating blows. That's not at all the same. At all. Oh my god. I can't believe you'd even compare. How is it not the same? Well... He must have failed the righteous indignation quick time event because he's reduced to feeling like an excuse for a lost penny in their easy chair. It's not like I had sex with Ramona. Right. Wallace laughs meanly. You just stayed the whole night and did nothing but hold hands. Sure. Tell me, was Ramona aware of the whole knives thing when she told you you could stay the night? She wasn't, because Scott had not mentioned knives or even thought of her at all. Fifteen minutes ago, he could have even admitted that without a smidge of guilt or suspected intent, but it's not fifteen minutes ago. Instead, it's now, and everything Wallace has been hitting him with has had him second-guessing the whole disaster of a situation. Hadn't there been a certain deliberation to that admission? 
I had you thought... You planned? He can't accept that. Can't even think about that, so he gropes around in desperation for an excuse that will somehow absolve him. It's not like I even touched knives, okay? I never even... ever thought about it. But you did ask that out. What was all that about? Were you planning to go with that? Come on! You know Knives and me! We aren't really dating. Oh yes, I know. Does Knives? Well, she may not know about Ramona, but she certainly knows he kissed Wallace on account of her being front and center to see it, thanks to Ramona's evil hipster pirate ex. Scott only had weird calls and his own ex's erratic behavior to figure out she was cheating. If he'd had ever actually real life seen her making out with that, that cocky pretty boy. Scott suddenly, and quite desperately, feels like English needs a stronger word than vertigo. Unfortunately, the only other language that Scott sort of knows is school-level French, and a tortoise month lacks the right amount of oomph. I think I'm gonna pass out. He announces instead, the voice small. He absolutely means it. And he must sound like he means it, because Wallace stops glaring at him long enough to sigh and put his arms around him. Scott clings back, sinking into it like a lifeline. He hates this, everything that's going on, this sudden understanding of just enough things for everything to be awful. It must be the trauma of all of it, that is Scott thinking out of nowhere about the poor protagonist of that Kafka book. Only, instead of waking up one morning to find his body hideously contorted into that of a monstrous vermin, Wallace just said a few things and made him horribly aware that he's been a giant cockroach all along. It's, it's not like that. Y you know that, right? I'm not like that, is what he means, and Wallace knows. Wallace should know this already, and it's suddenly crucial to get some sort of confirmation because, because if he doesn't... He's very exhaustingly used to not understanding things around him. Has been for a while, and yet today feels like the first time in his life the realization of how little he understands the things inside him hits him like a train wreck. Wallace? I'm not saying this to hurt you, Guy. It's not an agreement. It's not what he wants. It's not enough. It may as well be nothing. But you are. You're hurting me a lot, he thinks. Resentment thick on his throat. But he can't voice it, because awfully enough, the fact he kind of deserves it can no longer be argued. At least not by him. I'm sorry. He says again. Bumping his head against Wallace's shoulder. Distressed. Don't be mad at me. It's too much of a demand to be a request. But he can't deal with everything that's happened tonight, and Wallace's anger is the cherry on top. He just can't. I know. I know you. Wallace doesn't sound quite so incensed anymore, which he supposes is a good thing. Or at least he would if he wasn't sure it was because he was getting over it, and not pulling verbal punches out of pity. You never go out of your way to hurt people, but you also don't really notice or care when you do. Because, as far as you're concerned, you're the main character in the story. And if it's not part of the Scottiverse, you don't care about it. Definitely not pity, then. Wallace continues to be a ruthless bastard. Scott even hates the way he says it, like he's stating a fact. 
Sky is blue, water is wet, capitalism is not a sustainable financial model, and Scott is a self-centered, cockroachy asshole. It's not fair. Of course he cares. He cares a lot. He just didn't think of it like that. You're not fair either, buddy. I'm sorry. Do you even know what you're sorry for? Wallace retorts. Existing? Being me? Scott thinks. But doesn't say. Instead, shaking his head as an excuse to sink more into the hug. Wallace can't be that mad if he's hugging him. As if to corroborate that theory, Wallace gives him a squeeze. Scott. Guy. I know you're sorry now, okay? I'm sure of it, but that really isn't enough when you keep doing the same shit over and over. I just want a relationship that can work, he blurts without thinking, and immediately regrets the selfish sincerity of it. But do you want someone because you want them? Or will anyone do, as long as you don't have to be alone? Scott flinches at the word. It's not like he can help it. Alone feels like a menace, bolded, highlighted, and potentially conducting enough voltage to end him if he gets too close. Alone is how he feels all the time, when he lets himself think about it. And while he no longer feels like the sheer magnitude of the emotions may kill him, he's still not quite over occasionally wishing it had. Thinking like that disturbs him, so as usual, he avoids it like the plague, squeezing Wallace closer and choosing to remain obstinately quiet. He doesn't have to talk. He has rights. If everything he says and even thinks can and will be used against him, he's not opening his mouth or firing neurons unless it's asked for a lawyer. His dad may be out of the country, but Lawrence has always done getting his degree, right? He'll wait it out. What's another couple years? Wallace sighs again. And Scott tells himself it's not physically possible for him to sound that disappointed. But allows the tighter embrace for a time-dilated second. Then he's pulling away. And Scott has no option but to drop his hands as well. Eyes on the floor. Shop's closed. Time to go home and all that. He hears Wallace open his mouth to say something. And he preemptively braces for it. Shoulders hunching and eyes squeezing shut in expectation for a verbal blow that doesn't come. Instead, Wallace huffs. Annoyed, most likely. And brushes cold fingers against his cheek. And Scott leans into it immediately without thinking. Lids closing at the sheer relief and exhaustion of it all. I'm tired, Wallace says, and Scott nods against his hand. Tired is the understatement of the century. He hasn't felt this wrung out in 425 days. Not that he's counting, that's what accountant Scott is for, and he's out of office. And the office has gone up in flames, with strong suspicion of arson in service of insurance fraud. It's only when the silence goes on and on that he forces his eyes open, the charged quiet cluing him in that this is neither lost time nor an artificial parenthesis. Wallace is very close again giving him a weird, searching look that Scott can't even begin to process. Then he leans even closer, and it dawns on Scott that he intends to kiss him. He doesn't want it. Not now that he knows the other is mad at him. 
He doesn't even get why Wallace would want to, and he obviously thinks God's the worst comeback on God's green earth. He pulls back a bit, and Wallace drops his hand immediately. The silence between them stretches in twisted, unnatural, chiropractic ways. It never has before, and Scott hates it. Right, Wallace says, rubbing at his own face. I bet I'm... I'm going home. You go somewhere else. Scott looks up immediately. What? Why? Because you still haven't broken up with your fake high school girlfriend. Things are weird between us right now, and I'm too drunk for this conversation, but not drunk enough to not be thinking about sex. Oh. Okay. Scott says. Mind selectively blank. But tomorrow you're going to forgive me, and not be mad at me. Presuming I survived that long, you mean? The look Wallace gives him is not amused. I'm sure Stacy won't try to break in if she doesn't think you're home. You probably should lock all the doors and keep the lights off. Wallace closes his eyes and massages them like he's getting a migraine, and Scott wishes there had been a proficiency class on shutting the fuck up back in fifth grade. He would have used it a lot more than the sword one. He's sure of it. Look, Scott. I'm going to issue an ultimatum. One of your famous ultimatums? It may live in infamy, yes. Okay, he says, considering he has no say on the matter. Wallace's ultimatums are never optional quests. As if to illustrate this, he starts ticking off fingers. Plural. Break up with knives. Call off your sister before she ends me. And apologize to the poor Amazon delivery girl. You can come back when you do all of these. Scott boggles at his roommate's retreating back in horror. The- That's not an ultimatum! That's a whole list! Wallace smiles at him over his shoulder, lifting up a single finger. Scott's not surprised it's the middle one. And now you get extra for bitching. Figure your shit out before coming back home. It's only when he's out of sight that Scott realises his roommate not only hassled him with a full docket to follow, Wallace didn't even actually agree to forgive him for anything. Chapter 5 Hours Later At Stephen Stills He ends up dropping by Stephen Stills' place to spend the night, which turns out to be a mistake because Stephen Stills wants to talk. Or, more accurately, he doesn't want to shut up about it. But why did you do it? He demands, for like, the twentieth time. Scott holds the pillow very tight, because if he doesn't, he may choose to smother Stephen Stills with it. He didn't beg Kim to stay over, because her roommates were all mean and scary and walk around in their underwear, which disturbs him, and also because Kim would have teased him mercilessly until morning. Despite knowing this, the regret he feels over this choice knows no bounds. I don't know, he groans, ignoring Stephen Still's glare, intense and demanding. Scott stubbornly keeps his eyes on the ceiling. But how did it happen? Dunno. So you just did it? Y- No? He turns to his side, distressed. I don't- No. Was it an impulse? 
An unstoppable impulse. Is that how it starts? He can feel Stephen Still's eyes bore through his soul and past his back. I don't know. But what was it like? Even if his feelings on the topic had not been complicated on their own, Scott can't justify it for himself. Let alone to another person he's going to have to explain things out loud to. What can he say? That it was fucking great? That he wished the pirate guy hadn't interrupted so they could have continued at least a bit more? That he kind of would do it again if he wasn't sure Wallace was now pissed at him? That it was honestly the most easy and content he's felt with anything related to intimacy he's felt in, well, at least a year plus some change, which is the last thing he wants to think about right now, let alone discuss with Stephen Stills. He squeezes his eyes shut. I don't know, normal. Like, kissing another person. Like that. But he's a guy, I know. So it's the same. Like, kissing a girl. No. So it is different. Don't you have work in the morning? Scott squeezes the pillow like it's Stephen Still's neck. Shouldn't you be sleeping? glorious silence for all of 13 seconds and Scott knows because he counts them and then but dude Scott sits up eyes wide and expression harassed you want to try it or what Stephen Still's voice is very small when he says okay they kiss Scott feels not much, honestly. Stephen Stills is very hesitant, hugs too tight and uses an underwhelming amount of tongue. His hands are warm and his stubble is distractingly scratchy. It's not unpleasant and Scott doesn't hate it, but it's not like he likes it either. It's just a thing that happens and he's here for it. Like when he brushes his teeth or gets dragged grocery shopping. At least this kiss doesn't make him want to crawl out of his own skin the way Knives did. It's not like the blubby, flustered way that kissing Ramona felt like either. Much less like the whatever happened at the club was. It's a little weird because he doesn't mind kissing Stephen Stills. He's in fact even kind of glad he's doing this to the friend he knows and not a random stranger, since that usually just leaves him feeling awkward and stressed. Instead, he just feels tired, and very, very sleepy, and he just wants Stephen Stills to shut up for at least five consecutive minutes, and if this is what makes it happen, Scott will do it. He waits for Stephen Stills to pull away first, and wipes his mouth with what he hopes is impact finality. There. That's what kissing a guy is like. And now you know too, and we can shut up about it forever. Okay. Y yeah. Agrees Stephen Stills, nodding to himself. Then he bursts into tears. Scott stares in horror for a few seconds, too worried to be offended, reflexively reaching to awkwardly pat his arm more out of nerves than assurance. Uh, hey! Hey, no. C come on, dude. It wasn't that bad. I have a girlfriend, Scott. Stephen still sobs, burying his face in his hands. What am I supposed to tell her? Scott's stomach drops for the second time tonight. That's right. Julie is a thing. Terrifying, vengeful Julie, who's going to kill him for the treinous crime of putting his mouth on her man. Which sounds much worse than what actually happened, yet still is entirely accurate on a technical level. Nothing! That's what you're supposed to tell her. Didn't we just agree to never talk about it? I was there! You were there! He hopes the grin he's giving is less deranged than it feels like to Scott. But he's too busy shaking Stephen Stills to care. And if you think about it, it's like that tree in the forest with nothing around thing. If you kiss a guy and no one speaks about it, did it even happen? Of course it happened. 
Stephen stills pushes him away, wiping at his face. I can't pretend it didn't, and I, I can't not tell her. She's been with me for years. On and off. Very on and off. So you should at least cut the time in half. And aren't you two broken off right now? Scott's pearls of wisdom are clearly lost on Stephen Stills, who's just staring at his lap and usual flavor of spiraling, muttering to himself how she's never going to understand. Throwing up his hands, Scott grabs his pillow and marches downstairs to brave sleep on the cursed sofa, since obviously the bedroom is a no-rest zone right now. This sucks. He shouldn't even be here having to think about things, let alone actually dealing with them. This is so not fair. He hadn't asked for any of this. As if Knives or Wallace had. Whispered some dark, unidentified Scott personality fragment. Scott's eyes snap open, and he sits back up, casting a suspicious glare at the couch. He hasn't slept yet, so its slumbering evil energies couldn't have activated for him to be nightmared into any sort of self relevations which means the intrusive thoughts have found him again. With a denoyed groan, he makes a caterpillar of himself with the stolen blanket. Nope. He's not dealing with any of this. This isn't Scott's fault at all. None of the things, and, and Stephen Stills asked for it, okay? Scott could hardly be blamed for doing a favour for his friend. Is that why Wallace kissed him? As a favour? The thought alone makes his stomach hurt. Did Wallace even want to, or did he just think Scott wanted him to- No, Wallace wanted to kiss Scott. Obviously, you don't fake kissing like that. He thinks. It's not like Scott has had that much experience kissing, but he does know plenty about not being into it. Despite the internal assurance, the idea that Wallace just kissed him on a whim is somehow even worse than the guilt. Admitting defeat, and too unnerved by the likelihood a night on the couch would just add malediction on top of this spectacular row of bad luck, Scott gets up. He goes to the kitchen, and makes tea for Stephen Stills because he doesn't find any cocoa, and then spends the night listening to the incoherent babbling about his issues with Julie. All while Scott remains deeply, deeply convinced that the conversation they're having, and the one he thinks they're having, is not the same at all. In the morning, he walks Stephen Stills to work receiving the quest rewards of a hug, a leftover hummus wrap, and Stephen Stills' thanks. Scott understands nothing. At all. Hey, it's Mika. Thanks for watching the video. If you somehow watched this video and didn't watch Scott Pilgrim the Animated Show, go do that. Also join the Discord. Here's your ending segment. Hashtag number one asshole. Just overheard the curse knowledge that some people take BDSM as meaning business, development, sales, and marketing. Adonis Leanne. Oh no. Casper. My school offers that course. I've heard it's quite boring. Hashtag number one asshole. BDSM? Thanks to Ace for being hilarious and also regularly compiling these for me. Have a good week.